Hey, let us talk about mythology. This time, let us talk about Ishtar or Inanna. In Mesopotamian mythology, the gods and heroes often feel larger than life. Their power, worship, and presence were essential for life on Earth. Some gods, like Enlil, were so revered that humanity's very existence depended on them. While others, like Enki, would step in to help ensure humanity's survival. Well, in any case, the gods were seen as crucial to life. So, without them, humans were basically doomed. Now, among all these gods and goddesses, there is one figure who seems to pop up more often than most. The Sumerian goddess Inanna, also known as Ishtar, by the Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. Inanna was the goddess of love, sensuality, fertility, and even war. She had so much influence. That she could have easily overshadowed other big names, simply because of how broad her powers were. Now, before we are diving even further into our journey, please like this video and subscribe, and if possible, share this video as well. Now, Inanna's reach extended far beyond Mesopotamia too. It's believed she inspired goddesses like Chaushka from the Etiopian mythology. Who presented fertility, healing, and war? She may have also influenced the Greek goddess Aphrodite, and even the Roman goddess Venus, both goddesses of love, beauty, sex, and desire. As we mentioned, Inanna was known to the Sumerians, while the Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians knew her as Ishtar. Originally. They were thought to be two separate goddesses, but during the reign of Shagon the Great, who was the first ruler of the Akkadian Empire, Inanna and Ishtar became one. Shagon the Great himself gave credit to both Anu and Inanna or Ishtar for his success and power, which boosted her popularity even more. Inanna's name is believed to come from Sumerian term Ninanak, meaning Queen of Heaven or Lady of Heaven, which really highlights her importance. Ishtar's name, on the other hand, might be linked to the West Semitic god Attar, who was associated with the planet Venus. There is a cool detail about Attar. Well, depending on when the star appeared, either during the day or at night, it was considered either male for war or female for love. Ishtar's influence over both love and war fits perfectly with this, and that might explain the origin of her name. But like with many Mesopotamian gods, though. The origins of their names can be a bit murky, so we can't be one hundred percent sure. But for Inanna, it's not just her name that sparks debate; it's what she represents. I mean, a goddess who stands for both love and war. Talk about contradictions, right? One interesting idea about Inanna's development revolves around the time. Before she merged with Ishtar, some say Inanna not only absorbed Ishtar's domain, but also picked up powers from other gods. This might explain the seemingly odd combination of her being a goddess of both love and war, two totally different vibes. Another theory suggests that Inanna might have originally been a Proto-Euphratian goddess, and only later got incorporated into the Sumerian pantheon. This could explain her youthful energy compared to the other gods. Now she ended up with domains that weren't already taken or suited her better. 
After Shagon's reign, Inanna's cult really took off, and temples dedicated to her popped up all over the place, in cities like Lagash, Nippur, Churupak, Ur, and Zabalam. But the main temple, known as the Eana Temple, was in Uruk. Eana translates to House of Heaven, and interestingly, it originally belonged to Anu, one of the most important gods at the time. However, as Inanna's popularity soared, the temple was eventually converted in her honor and became the home for her priestesses. There is even some mythology to explain this temple takeover in the poem Inanna Takes Command of Heaven. In the story, Inanna is pretty bummed that such an impressive temple doesn't belong to her, and she decides she is going to claim it. She goes through all kinds of trials to get it, and when she finally confronts Anu, he is pretty taken aback by her ambition. Despite being her superior, he ends up giving in and turns over the temple. Some people interpret the story as Anu realizing he is no longer the most popular god, and that Inanna is the new favorite. Others think it symbolizes the shift of power from the priests of Anu to the priestesses of Inanna. While Inanna's cult flourished in Uruk, Ishtar also gained quite a bit of influence in Assyria, especially during the reign of King Ashur Banipal. In fact, she became one of the most revered gods in the Assyrian pantheon, even overtaking Ashur, the natural god of Assyria. Another cool thing about Inanna's temples was the presence of the Gala priests, who were thought to defy traditional gender norms and took on female names. In Acadia, servants of Ishtar were said to dress in woman's clothing and perform dances in her temples. Some ancient stories even suggest that they might have been homosexual, which gives us a peek into how early Sumerian and Akkadian societies viewed gender and sexuality. It seemed to be much less of an issue back then than we might think. As another example, see the Gilgamesh apples, where at multiple times there is a hint that Gilgamesh would love Enkidu like a woman. Speaking of interesting rituals, the kings of Uruk apparently used to roleplay as Dumuzid, Inanna's consort. To legitimize their rule, they'd take part in a sacred marriage ceremony, usually during the New Year festival. This involved sleeping with one of Inanna's priestesses, who was also playing the role of Inanna. There's also some speculation that Ishtar's cult might have been connected to sacred prostitution because of her association with sexuality. But it's not clear if that was really a thing. As for offerings, women would also bake cakes made from ash to honor Ishtar in some rituals. Inanna and Ishtar were also depicted through various symbols and gestures. For instance, clay models of voluptuous women were offered as representations of strength and possibly even of the goddess herself. One of the most iconic symbols tied to both Inanna and Ishtar is the eight-pointed star, which some believe is associated with either the heavens or Venus. During the Babylonian period, there are even accounts of slaves in Ishtar's temples being branded with this star symbol. Another symbol often connected to Inanna is the knot of reeds, 
thought to represent the doorpost of a storehouse, a symbol of fertility. Later on, a rosette, which is round, flowery design, replaced the eight-pointed star as Inanna's primary symbol. Lions were also linked to her, fierce, powerful animals. It mirrored her own strength. Some myths suggest Inanna could take the form of a lion, or that lions accompanied her into battle. But aside from lions, Inanna also had a connection to doves, which were seen as a sacred bird to her. She might have been able to take on the form of a dove herself. Now. Despite being a goddess of love, Inanna was often described as reckless, even a bit foolhardy, with a devil-may-care attitude. She constantly strove for power. When it came to war and conquest, she could be pretty ruthless. This made her almost antagonistic at times, especially in the myths where her warlike nature overshadowed. Her own as a love goddess. Speaking of love, her relationships were often volatile. Her consort Numazid didn't always get the best treatment from her, as we see in the myth Inanna's descent into the underworld. In that story, she abandoned Numazid and even sent demons to drag him down to the underworld in her place. In fact, Inanna. Got a bit of a reputation for being more crucial in her love life. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh himself accuses her of mistreating all of her lovers. And there are even tales suggesting that her own brother Utu, the sun god, was among her lovers, and the two were known to be incredibly close. Together, they formed a sort of holy trinity with their father, Nana, the god of the moon. Inanna also had an older sister, Ereshkigal, the goddess of the underworld. They didn't cross paths often in mythology, except for the famous tale of Inanna's descent into the underworld, where the two sisters were pitted against each other. Depending on the myth, Inanna's parentage shifts around a bit. Sometimes she is described as the daughter of Nanna, while in other stories she is the daughter of Anu, the supreme sky god. And there are even myths where Enlil, the god of earth, or Enki, the god of waters, take on the role of her father. As for Inanna's own children. There isn't much evidence to suggest she had any. There is also merely an idea that the warrior god Shada was her son, but there is not much substance to back it up. Similarly, Lulal, the younger brother of Shada, was also thought to be one of Inanna's children. Though again, there is not much support for this. Inanna's mythology portrays her in a wide range of roles, from heroic to innocent, and even darker, more ruthless versions of herself. For example, in the Sumerian hymn Inanna and Utu, she is portrayed as fairly new to her powers. Although she is the goddess of snakes, she is inexperienced. With her brother Utu's guidance. She descends into the underworld to taste the fruit of a special tree that grows there. By eating this fruit, the secrets of sex are revealed to her, and she fully embraces her sensuality. Another story that shows a more innocent side of Inanna is the poem "Inanna Prefers the Farmer." In this tale, two gods. Enkimdu, a farmer, and Numusid, a shepherd, are vying for Inanna's hand in marriage. At first, she actually prefers 
and Kimlo. But after Dumuzid convinces her, with a little help from Uto, she changes her mind and marries the shepherd instead. And this same sense of innocence and youth is also highlighted in the story of Inanna and the Hulufu tree, where she comes across as almost helpless or naive. In this tale, Inanna plants a tree in her city of Uruk, hoping to one day use its wood to craft herself a throne. She takes great care of the tree for years, but over time, a snake makes a nest in its root, a bird settles in the branches, and a mischievous spirit known as a lilitu burrows deep into the trunk. When Inanna discovers these unwelcome ghosts, she is heartbroken. She cries throughout the night, upset that her plans for the tree have been ruined. At dawn, she sees her brother Uto flying across the sky, beginning his daily journey from east to west. Hoping he can help, she calls out to him, explaining the situation. But Utu, ever a busy zangot, tells her that he can't stop his important task of carrying the sun across the sky. He also hints that even if he could, he probably wouldn't bother, since this isn't really a problem he cares about. With Utu unwilling to help, Inanna turns to the hero Gilgamesh. And he comes to her aid, slaying the snake, scaring off the bird, and banishing the lily to spirit from the tree. He even goes the extra mile and cuts down the wood, gifting it to Inanna, so she can finally have her throne. In this story, we see a very different side of Inanna. She's no longer the fierce goddess of war, conquering lands and striking fear into her enemies. Instead, she seems vulnerable, lacking the strength or will to deal with the snake, the bird, or the lily to spirit on her own. She calls out to her brother for help, but when he refuses, she turns to a mortal, Gilgamesh, to do the heavy lifting for her. But here we have to be careful, because it is also said in the Gilgamesh apples that Gilgamesh is two thirds divine and one third mortal. So, he is more god than human, but Gilgamesh can die, which technically makes him a mortal nonetheless. It's interesting to think that a goddess of war would need anyone, let alone a mortal, to handle conflict on her behalf. But in this instance, Inanna doesn't hesitate to ask for help and even seems grateful for Gilgamesh's efforts. Now, in the story of Inanna and Enki, we start to see Inanna's more ambitious and cunning side. This tale shows Enki, the god of wisdom and creation, holding the sacred Meh, a divine power that governs the laws of the universe and allows for creation itself. Knowing this, Inanna decides to visit Enki's temple in Enidu, with her plan in mind. She challenges him to a drinking contest, and as the drinks flow, Enki becomes intoxicated. Taking advantage of the situation, Inanna steals the mare from him and makes her gateway on the boat of heaven. When Enki wakes up the next morning, Hung over, and realizing what happened, he is furious. He sends all sorts of monsters and creatures after Inanna to retrieve the stolen power, but none of them are any match for her. He escapes back to her home in Uruk, and Enki eventually gives up the chase, accepting that his powers now belong to her. Some scholars interpret the story as a symbolic transfer of power from Enki to Inanna, reflecting the shift in influence as Inanna's popularity soared. It could be seen as a tale about how the people started to revere Inanna, 
more than the other gods, leaving Enki and the others in her shadow. This ambitious drive is also present in the fragmentary poem Inanna Takes Command of Heaven. In this piece, we see Inanna striving to take over the Aana temple in Uruk. Although parts of the text are missing, we know that Inanna journeys to the dangerous marshland, which was considered an incredibly risky and unwise move. However, she manages to emerge from the marshes completely unharmed, much to her father Anu's shock. He is not just surprised by her survival, but also by her audacity in wanting to take control of the temple. Despite his concerns, Inanna succeeds in taking over the Yana temple, and there is nothing Anu can do to stop her. Once again. This story seems to highlight Inanna's meteoric rise, as she rapidly gains power and influence, overshadowing many of the other gods, and even claiming their territories as her own. In the Akkadian poem Inanna and Abi, we get a glimpse of Inanna's more destructive and impulsive side. While traveling the world. She comes across Mount Ebi, and is initially struck by its beauty, but soon the admiration turns to resentment. Inanna feels insulted by the mountain's glory, thinking that nothing should be allowed to rival her own magnificence. Overcome by jealousy and rage, she starts yelling at the mountain and even argues with Anu, demanding the right to destroy it. Anu, however, seems to be fond of the mountain and forbids her from acting on her impulse. But Inanna, true to her Capricorn nature, disobeys Anu and destroys the mountain anyway. In this story, we see Inanna in a less flattering light. Her jealousy takes over, and she acts impulsively, defying the supreme god himself. This portrayal of her as an aggressive and envious deity. Highlights her darker side, showing that even something as innocent as a mountain isn't safe from a ref. It's a reminder of the sheer power she holds, and how easily she can unleash destruction on anything that displeases her. But what happens when someone actually deserves a ref? Well. In the hymn Inanna and Shukale Tuta, we get a much different story. Shukale Tuta is a gardener who is very good at his job. Despite his efforts, none of the trees seem to grow, except for one. One day, Inanna happens to rest under this tree, and instead of being grateful that a goddess jails his tree, Shukale Tuta makes a horrible decision. He strips Inanna of her clothes while she sleeps, and does things to her. When Inanna wakes up and realizes what's happened, she goes into an uncontrollable rage. She vows to hunt Shukare Tuda down, but her fury doesn't stop with him. In the process of searching for him, she unleashes devastating plagues upon the earth. Turning oceans to blood and spreading chaos, Chocolate Huda, fearing for his life, hides in the city, following his father's advice to blend in with the crowd, and hope that Inanna won't find him. But Inanna's rage only intensifies, and she creates powerful storms to ravage the land, and she finally tracks down Chocolate Huda. He begs for mercy, but Inanna has none. She brutally ends him to avenge the violation he committed. This story, contrasted sharply with Inanna and Abi, is here. Inanna's anger is more justified. Shukaletuda committed a heinous crime, 
and Inanna's wrath, though destructive, serves as a divine retribution. Yet, even in this story, her rage spills over, impacting far more than just a guilty party. It's a testament to her power and the dangerous consequences of crossing her. Before descending into the underworld, Inanna instructs her servants to go to Enlil, Nanna, Anu, and Enki for help if she doesn't return in three days. She's heading to the funeral of her brother-in-law, and to do so, she dresses in all her finest clothing, which includes a turban, beads, jewelry, and a measuring rod. Each of these items symbolizes her power. When she finally arrives at the underworld, the gatekeeper Niti questions her visit. Inanna explains that she has come to pay her respects and support her sister, Erishkigal, in mourning. This part of the story reveals a softer, more compassionate side of Inanna. Despite her wild and impulsive nature, she values family and shows genuine care for her grieving sister. But when Niti informs Erishkigal of Inanna's arrival, Ereshkigal's reaction isn't exactly warm. Instead of welcoming her sister, she tells Neti to close the gates and only open them a crack, forcing Inanna to pass through slowly. And what's more, Ereshkigal commands that Inanna be stripped of one garment at each gate. And there are a few possible reasons for this. Either Inanna's outfit was inappropriate for the funeral rites. Or, Ereshkigal was stripping her sister of her powers, reminding her that in the underworld, she holds no sway. Another idea is, Ereshkigal didn't trust Inanna's intentions, so she made sure to weaken her out of suspicion. By the time Inanna reaches the last gate, she is completely unclothed and vulnerable. But even stripped of her clothes, and possibly her dignity, Inanna still manages to assert herself. She usurps her sister in her own domain, boldly sitting on the throne. However, the judges of the underworld, the Anunnaki, are not impressed. These children of Anu are so disgusted by Inanna's actions that their scolding is so powerful it literally turns her into a corpse. Three days pass, and Inanna's loyal servant, Ning Shubur, realizes her mistress hasn't returned. Remembering Inanna's instructions, she seeks help from the gods. She pleads to Anu, Nanna, Enlil, and Enki to rescue Inanna from the underworld. But all, except Enki, refuse. The other gods think that Inanna got what she deserved over stepping her bounds and trying to take over her sister's realm. But Enki, often seen as Inanna's father figure, steps in to help. He creates two genderless beings, Galatura and Kurjara, from the crime under his fingernails. These creatures are sent to the underworld to retrieve Inanna's body and bring her back to life by sprinkling her with the food and water of life. They succeed, but Inanna's escape isn't that simple. Ereshkigal sends demons after her, determined to keep her in the underworld, unless someone takes her place. Realizing she can't keep Inanna against her will, Ereshkigal sends the demons to Earth to find a substitute. The demons first try to take Ninshubu, but Inanna protects her loyal servant. Then, they try to take Shara, her beautician, but he is spared as well, because he had mourned for his goddess. Finally, 
The demons find Inanna's husband, Numusid, who is lounging with slave girls and seemingly having the time of his life. Unlike Ninshubu and Chara, Numusid hadn't mourned Inanna at all. Thus, he hadn't even tried to save her. Furious at his lack of regard, Inanna offers him up as her replacement, and the demons track him to the underworld. This story gives us a glimpse into Inanna's complex nature. In the first half, we see her as a caring, family-oriented deity who generally wants to support her sister in a time of need. But by the second half, we are reminded of her fiery temper and vengeful tendencies when she discovers that her husband hasn't shown her the love and loyalty she expected. She doesn't hesitate to exact her revenge. In a way, her reactions seem almost human, reflecting the emotional response we might have in a similar situation. So, I personally can certainly not blame her for doing what she has done. Much like anyone who acts out impulsively, Inanna soon regrets her rash decision. In The Return of Tumusid, we see her begin to pine for her husband. Alongside his sister, Gesht Inanna, Inanna searches for him, showing her softer side once again. A passing fly reveals Dumuzid's location, and Inanna discovers that he has escaped the underworld for a short time. Relieved to see him, and perhaps feeling guilty for her early actions, she agrees that Dumuzid will spend half the year in the underworld with her sister Erich Gigal, and the other half in heaven with her. What's interesting here is. That despite Inanna's power, especially in the heavens, she still respects the rules of the underworld. She doesn't try to bend the laws to suit her needs, which contrasts with her usual deviance toward Anu. Instead, she makes a fair compromise. Dumuzid's absence in the underworld will be filled by her sister, Gestinanna. During the time he spends with Inanna, this gesture shows Inanna's respect for each realm and her siblings. Something we don't often see in her interactions with other gods, especially Anu, whom she regularly defies and even usurps in terms of worship. In the Akkadian version of this story, we see a more aggressive side of Ishtar. After being unclothed in the underworld, she goes on to offensive against her sister, but she is ultimately subdued by Erskigal's forces and punished by being infected with over fifty diseases. With Ishtar trapped in the underworld, all sexual activity on Earth comes to a halt, and no new life is born. This makes Ishtar's role as the goddess of sexuality and fertility even more apparent, as her absence causes a breakdown in the cycle of life. Once again, it's the Akkadian equivalent of Enki, known as Ea, who sends two creatures to rescue her. But what's interesting in this version is how Ishtar's absence threatens the entire human legacy. Without reproduction, humanity's future grinds to a halt. This gives Ea the urgency to act and save Ishtar, knowing that without her, life itself is in danger. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, we see a completely different side of Ishtar. After Gilgamesh and his companion Enkidu defeat the ogre Umbaba. Ishtar is so impressed with Gilgamesh that she tries to make him her lover. But Gilgamesh, knowing her reputation, flat out rejects her. He reminds Ishtar that her past lovers never fared well, 
of nanning up dad, or worse. Ishta doesn't hey reject lightly, especially from a mortal. Feeling deeply insulted, she rushes to Anu and complains about the slight. But Anu, clearly tired of her antics, tells her to take matters into her own hands if she wants revenge. So, following Anu's advice, Ishta decides to get even with Gilgamesh. But she doesn't stop there. She insists on boring the bow of heaven, a mythical beast, to wreak havoc on him. When Anu hesitates, Ishta threatens to break upon the doors of the underworld, unleashing demons and the dead to feast on the living. As always, Ishta doesn't hold back, and their threats are so intense that even Anu relents, giving her the pull of heaven to calm her down. But, despite her best efforts, Ishta's plan backfires. Gilgamesh and Enkidu manage to defeat the bull of heaven, even sacrificing its heart to the sun god Shamash. The scene ends with Ishta cursing Gilgamesh on the walls of Uruk. In one last display of deviance, Enkidu tears off the bull's leg and hurls it at Ishta's face, showing that her power is no match for the two heroes. And if you want to know what happens after, and if it was a really wise decision to anger her, I highly encourage you to listen to the audiobook I recorded about the apples of the Gilgamesh. Venture with me into the shadowy realms of ontology where hidden connections and forbidden knowledge await. Together, we will uncover the dark secrets that lie beneath the surface of these ancient tales revealing that there is much more to mythology than most stories, and there are profound truths waiting to be discovered. So, join me on this journey and let's explore the mysteries together. Thanks for watching.